computer. Hey, there we go. All right. So part one of this video I just recorded. Let's look at part two. Part two is a little more detail about kind of what's going on here. So I want to talk about servlets, but I'll do that later. I want to talk about the JSON stuff, but I'll do that later. Uh, and I want to first talk about kind of what happens when things go wrong. Um, now on my Mac here, I've got two terminals open. Um, on Mac, when you want to list everything, you type ls. That works on Windows as well. Sorry, that works on Linux as well. On Windows, you would type dir. If I type dir on a Mac, it's not going to know what I mean. The cd command is equivalent to clicking. So let me... Uh, wait, really? Hold on. Oh, God, that's terrible. Hold on. File. What? New finder. How about new finder window? There we go. And I don't know, downloads. I don't know, whatever. Let's, um, let me pull this over here. So, uh, here's my finder. So this is like showing me a bunch of stuff. If I double click into a folder, boop. There. Okay. This was a simple server folder. That's equivalent to a CD. And if I click this back button, that's equivalent to CD dot dot. So what I'm going to do is go find, so 208, uh, C, oh, C sharp 208. Where, oh my gosh, where is it? Why am I not? Simple server. There it is. That's my simple server. So this is, this is my simple server folder. So if I, so right, so we can see there's these CS files. That stands for C sharp. There's this CS project file. That's a configuration file for .NET. Um, these folders I put in there, files in JSON, these folders bin an object. I'll show you what's in there in a second. Um, but I just want to show you how this corresponds to command line. So if we do LS or in Windows, you do DIR, it's going to show you all of that. Now, it's not going to tell you that this is a directory, this is a folder, and that this isn't. On Linux or Mac, you would do LS-capital-F, and it puts a slash after the ones that are folders. I don't know how to make Windows do that, but you could Google it. Um, for CD, so I could say CD space files. That puts me in there. Now I could type LS. It'll show me what's in there. PWD also works on Windows present working directory. will give you the path. I'm in users, Jamie Spacco, downloads, test, simple server files. Oh, this one is, um, that's interesting. Um, where's this one? PWD. This is kind of fascinating. Um, this is users Jamie Spacco documents Knox 208 C sharp simple server. That, that corresponds to this, right? This path to this simple server, this one right here. If I uh, right, if I right click this and I do uh get info and it and you can do properties or get info on Windows as well, and it shows me the full path. Here's the full path how to get there, right? This is telling me it's in my iCloud drive. This is actually very confusing on a Mac, what it's telling me. But we know it's in Documents, Knox, 208, C Sharp, 208. Then there's that simple server folder, right? That's telling me that. Interestingly, if I go over to here, that's where this one is. This other one, this is actually a different one. This is the one in Downloads. Um, this is actually the wrong folder. They both look the same right now because I haven't made any edits. But that's interesting. That was an error waiting to happen. So... Man, that PW, I swear I didn't even set this up. This happened by accident. Let me pretend I did it on purpose and then I'm a friggin' genius. Anyway, um, so if you have a situation where you have two folders with the same name and you want it and you have two terminals open, you're confused, PWD will tell you, and it's telling me right now, this is the wrong folder. So I'm going to CD into slash users and I'm just going to hit tab, J-A-I tab, uh, Knox tab 208 slash CSH for C sharp tab and then SIM tab. Now I'm hitting tab. I'm typing a couple letters until it's unique and hitting tab. And that's like a fancy autocomplete. And that works on both Windows and Macs. Um, and that's because programmers are lazy and don't want to have to sit there and type stuff out. So you just type enough letters to make it unique and hit tab. tab. Now let me show you something. Now I'm in here. If I just hit CD enter, on a Mac, it'll take me back to my home directory, which is like slash users, whatever. I don't know how to do that on Windows. I'm not sure what happens if you just hit CD on Windows. Try it. 
Um, so if I do PWD, that's where I am. Now from here, if I hit CDD tab, it doesn't complete. And if I hit tab twice, it will show me, well, do you mean desktop documents or downloads, right? So that's why I say type enough letters for it to be complete. So if you had simple server and, you know, sim simian, you know, you know, monkey pox or something, um, if you typed SIM tab, it wouldn't know which of those you meant, right? So that's just sort of something to keep in mind with the tab completion. So I'm going to do Knox and I'm going to do... Uh, 208, I'm going to do C sharp, and I'm going to do simple server, boom. So now if I do PWD, this looks the same as this one. So now I'm in the same folder in both places. Wow, that could have been ugly. Um, okay, so I'm going to run my server, which is .NET run. Um, should I tell you anything else about command line? Um, PWDs, oh, to, to move up a directory. So I'm in the simple server directory. If I want to go back to the C sharp directory, I would do CD space dot dot. Dot dot means the previous directory. That's equivalent on a, uh, like in Finder on a Mac or in like Windows Explorer on Windows to like double clicking something and being like, oh, I don't want this one going back a folder somehow. And then like back a folder, that's dot dot. If you want to go back two folders, I could do CD dot dot slash dot dot. Now in Windows, um, the cd dot dot is like one command. It's like this cd dot dot for whatever reason. And I don't know how to do two of them. I'm just not sure. Also on Windows, the slashes go like this. And on Linux and Mac, the slashes go like this. Um, the root of a Mac is like slash users. The root of Windows would be, you know, C colon slash whatever. Um, you know, so if you want to do like the full path. So just sort of keep that stuff in. You can Google some of this stuff. Um, for figuring this out. We're not doing a ton of command line, but we're doing a little bit. Command line is how most programmers do things. Um, it it just is. It's an arcane, magical syntax that dates back decades, that's built up over the years, but it is really powerful. It's very fast for doing a lot of things you want to do. And it's pretty heavily standardized across things that are, you know, Linux and Mac, um, and to some extent, Windows with the new PowerShell is starting to kind of standardize on a, a type of command line. So it is a really powerful way to do things that's worth knowing. Okay, so that's command line stuff. Let me show you if I do .NET run. Uh, I'm running the server. Here it goes. Blah, 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 blah. Now, if I go to here, we know we have my campus map. Okay, great. I load this up. The campus map is there. Suppose I did this wrong. Right. I, I forgot that you have to capitalize and I did campus map lowercase e lowercase m. Well, it actually figures that out. Uh, what if I wanted um, a cat picture, cat.png? Now, I don't have any cat pictures. Here we're getting an error message, right? Cat PNG, this localhost page can't be found. We're getting HTTP error 404. Now, if we go back to here and we look at, you know, I don't know what we've got here. You can see, whoops, we asked for cat PNG waiting for connection, um, but we got back a 404. It didn't work. We couldn't find that path. Now, what's happening in the code when that happens is buh, 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 buh. that's basically this. If file dot exists, cat PNG, well, it doesn't exist. That's this part. That's this else. Set the status code to not found, which basically is ends up being 404. Um, then close the output stream. We weren't able to serve you any files. Now it is possible to serve a custom 404 page. Like you can send a web page and send status code 404. That'll cause the browser to view the page, but then also uh, like to view a web page, a special 404 file not found web page, but then also get back error code 404. To demonstrate this, let's go to Knox, www.knox.edu slash Jamie is a... -A you know, God among mere mortals dot HTML. Um, this better not work. See, page not found, but it's not giving like, like, you know, error page like this. It's giving like page not found, page you're looking for can't be found, some stuff, you know, but it's also got the Knox branding and whatever other stuff around it. So it's a 404 error page. We're still getting error code 404, but 
Um, but we're getting a bunch of the knock stuff around it. So it's a friendlier type of error message. That is something that we would like to do. Um, and I bet this page, I bet this is just like stored somewhere on the on the Noxus server. I don't know, something like that. Who knows? But I just wanted to show you kind of what's going on there with that. Um, other things I want to show you in, in here in how all this code works. Um, blah, blah, blah. Well, I'll talk, we got to talk about the servlets. So uh, the servlets are probably my favorite part. Uh, again, in the world of C Sharp, they probably don't call them servlets. I'm from a Java world where we called things servlets. I don't know. That, that's just what we're going to call them. So let's look at this. Um, I have this interface I servlet, and this is a, a naming convention you see. If something's an interface, they prefix it with a capital I and then call it whatever. Um, there's different naming conventions for how you name something an interface and things not interfaces. This is just the convention I'm using. And this interface, in order to be an I servlet, you just need this one method process request, which takes the listener context. Um, so this is an interface saying, hey, if you're a servlet, servlet is like a pun to mean like mini server. Like it's not a server, it's a servlet. Um, so it's like a mini little server side program. So given an HTTP listener context, you know, process it. So we have two of these. So book handler, I'll do second. The first one I'm going to do is, where is it? Ba -ba -da -ba. Is it this one? Come on. There we go. Is foo handler. So I called it foo handler, which implements iServlet, which means it gets this method. So we're providing an implementation for this method. What does this do? Well, I'm going to create a response as a string. This, um, so the ampersand before a string in C sharp means it's a multi-line string. That's why the string can have these enter keys in it. Um, I don't think you can do that at all in Java, but you can in C sharp because to have to like end the string and like put a new line and then plus the other string and then start another, like you can, you can do things like this in Java, but you can't just have a single multi-line string, at least not as of like Java nine or 10 or whenever I stopped learning new Java features. Um, this uh, dollar sign means this is going to be an interpolated string, which is how we've got this in here. This is the context request URL absolute path. We are doing a, a replacement of this. So it's going to like look in this listener context, get the request, get the URL and get the absolute path. Um, so this is a variable lookup essentially, but it's embedded within a string. That's why you can see the syntax highlighting kind of understands that that's what's going on. Um, so this is generating like an HTML response that we'd like to send. And then what we're doing here, um, we're going for each string in context request query string all keys. Oh, this is query strings. I'll show you that in a second. Um, it's sticking this in the end of the response. Right now, this is empty. We don't have any. So this isn't appending anything to the end of the string. But I'll show you in a second what that does. Then once we've built this string up, we're saying like, hey, uh, turn this into an array of bytes. So like system text encoding UTF-8 get bytes. So it's saying like UTF-8 just means ASCII, like 8-bit ASCII. It's saying like, well, this is an 8-bit ASCII string uh, encoded into an array of bytes and then tell the content type, it's text HTML, tell the length, uh, add these header information for date and last modified, status code 200, okay. You know, and then write to the output stream it, from this byte array, which should be, the bytes of the whole thing from zero to the length of bytes. So just like write the whole thing and then flush it. Because sometimes when you write stuff to a stream, it can't write every everything right away. So it's going to write as much as it can. And then it might have to like stop or wait or something like that. By saying flush, what you're saying is like, you know what, go ahead and write. And when you call this flush, you're like, I'll wait till you're done. I'll just wait. And then when it's done sending, you're like, okay, flush, you can return and move on. Right. Um, so sometimes that's necessary. Uh, cause we don't want to say, write And then like end the method and have it close the connection and whatever else when only half the data was sent. So this flush is like, listen, make sure you've sent all the data, then you can close up shop. Right. So all this is doing is generating a simple web page and shipping it out the door. But here's the freaking cool part about this. So this is like a separate class. And because it's C sharp, we don't have to have like a separate file for every class. We can stick a whole bunch of things together. So like the definition for this servlet, it's right here. Um, what did I just do? Go away. Whatever I just did, don't do it. There we go. So this interface is here. This class, ah, where'd it go? 
I make that noise a lot. I apologize. Uh, this is here. So this code is here. Now watch this. Here's our simple server. Check this out. We have a private static dictionary that's going to map a string to an iServlet. Now, which iServlet? I don't know. Just anything that implements that interface can go here. And I'm going to call this underscore servlets. I'm using this underscore. You don't have to use this underscore convention. In fact, I wouldn't even recommend doing it. It's just that like the core of this code that I found, which is cited up here, um, use that underscore convention for instance variables. I probably won't use that anywhere else except for this example. So you don't have to use that, that, that convention if you don't want to. Anyway, um, so this is like, okay, blah, 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 blah. What am I talking about again down here? Yeah, yeah. So servlets, new dictionary. This is like a way, look at, ah, what did I just do? Come back. Oh, this is killing me. Why does that keep happening? Come on. You know what? I'm just going to use, the, oh my God, it's jumping all over the place. It's because I have a new mouse and it's, I don't, you know, I don't know. You know what? Whatever. We won't use a mouse. I use a keyboard. That's fine. That's how we did it back in the 90s. It's fine. This is cool. So we have this, you know what? I could use the touchpad. That's fine too. We have this I dictionary. Check it out. Um, so it's mapping a string to an I servlet. So the string foo is bound to an instance of foo handler. And the string books is an instance of book handler. We haven't looked at book handler yet. We'll look at that next. So foo, this string, this is like the server side name of the program. And then foo handler with that process request that generates that little web page and whatever else, and then ships it out to the client. Watch this. How does this get invoked? Well, if we look at our blah, 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 blah. Right. Our process method, right? If we look at this, we get the file name and then we substring it. So it would be like, if it's slash foo, this substring one means like start at the first character. So basically throw away the initial slash. We don't want that initial slash. If that dictionary servlets contains the key file name. So if foo is in that dictionary, then look up the I servlet, call its process request method on the context. So on the ACP listener context from the client. So just do whatever that needs to do, send out the web page, whatever, and then just return because we've processed it, right? So this, we're like mapping where, oh my God, there's so much code in here. Uh, where is it? Boop, boop, boop. There we go. This is mapping the string foo to this, like an instance of this handler to this I servlet. So let me show you what happens when you actually run this. So we're in here, the server is still running. We come in here, we're like, you know what? I want to check out foo. Boom. Bam. There it is. You know, this code that we shipped out and you can see the full thing was slash foo. That's why we substringed it just to get foo, right? So I asked for foo. Foo isn't literally a file. There's no, there's no like web page, you know, foo.html or something sitting in that files folder. This was completely generated in code server side, right? All of this stuff here, where did this come from? Ah, no, 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 go back. Oh, yeah, where did this come from? Well, it came from Foo Handler. What does Foo Handler do? Well, it generated this web page and then it, you know, you know, set the content type and blah, 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 whatever, and then shipped it out to the client, right? So all that happened dynamically. There was no physical web page, no foo.html that we loaded off of a disk or something like that. We generated it all dynamically. Once we know we can generate HTML dynamically and send it to the client, Boom, it massively expands what we're capable of doing with what seems to be a simple web server, right? Serving up files, HTML files, PDF files that are statically sitting in a directory, that's easy. Our server already does that. That's fine. But dynamically generating web pages, that's powerful. Dynamically generating the same web page like the Foo handler does, not that interesting. Interesting, but not that interesting. What's going to be super interesting is book handler which we're going to see next. Okay. So good. So that's what's happening. That's what's happening there now. Good. All right. Let's look at book handler. Before we look at book handler, I need to show you books. Um, and to do that, I'm going to go back over to here and I'm going to say code file. No, it's called Jason. 
books.json. And I'll open this up. So books. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It is kind of a default way that people exchange data nowadays in text. So this is um, technically these are all JavaScript. Like this is a text encoding of JavaScript objects. Um, do you need to know that? Not really, uh, but you can if you want. It's fine. Um, so square bracket means it's a list. This curly bracket means essentially like a dictionary or a map. Key value pairs. Here's the key ID. Here's the value one. Here's the key title. Here's the value unlocking Android. Here's the key ISBN. Here's the value, I don't know, whatever that is and so on. So the keys are always strings. The values can be string or integer. Um, and it also could itself be a list, right? This book happens to have multiple authors. Here's a list of the authors. The category happens to have multiple categories. Here's a list of the categories. And then that's done with the first book. And then here's the second book, IDs two. Here's all the information about it. Where did I get this? I don't remember. I probably should cite the problem is you one problem with JSON. JSON is a great format, but one of the challenges is you can't put comments in JSON. And so I um I wanted to put a comment in here where I got this, but I didn't. It's not hard to find. Um I got it. Somebody's GitHub had this as some sample data to work with. Um so anyway, this has got, I don't know, a couple hundred books in it. Um, and they all, all of these look basically the same, you know, these categories and so on. Um, now this JSON, we want to like, is not that useful to us as C-sharp programmers. Like, yes, it's nice, but what we want to actually do is take this data and turn it into a class. And you can imagine this would be an integer. This would be a string. These are, these are the instance variables here. And these are the values of those instance variables. And what I want to do is I want to turn this list of JSON dictionary entries into a list of instances of book. So let's look at book because book is in here. Code book, no, book.cs. So if you look at this, there it is. Class book. I'm just C sharpening the heck out of this. Public int ID, get set, public string title, get set. I'm just like taking this, looking at this, figuring out what type this should be. And then I'm creating this. This is called a model class. I'm modeling it. Um, so I'm taking that JSON data. I'm creating a class where all of those keys in the JSON data for a single book, I'm matching it up with instance variables here. Cool. Now what I want to do is I want to read all of that JSON data into a list of instances of this book where the values of all of these are populated with the data from that JSON file. That's what I want to do. Well, how do I do that? Funny you should ask because I asked the internet and the internet told me. So here's book handler. Um, so this is bound to slash books. What is that doing? Well, let me show you what it does first and then we'll look at how it does it. Watch this. Instead of going to slash foo, I go to slash books. Boom, look at this. Um, title, author, short description, long description. And it's basically an HT HTML table. How did that happen? Funny you should ask. I'm going to tell you. Okay, so process request. We got the listener context. Uh, I'm creating serializ serializer options, property name case insensitive. The reason I'm doing that is if you look at this, these all start with lowercase letters. But if you remember in Java, uh, not Java, in C Sharp, we generally want to use an uppercase letter for these. Like that's the that's the standard for using these, um, like using this fancy way of doing get set for private data um, is to make sort of declare it public, but it's not really public. It's really a private hidden private variable with get set uh, accessors. But if I try to just use this, it's gonna get confused because here these start with a lowercase letter. Here it starts with an uppercase letter. So. What I'm going to do is create this options and be like, hey, property name case in case insensitive. In other words, we don't care about the case. Just match it as long as the characters are the same, regardless of whether they're upper or lowercase. Set that to true. Um, how did I know to do this? I don't know. I Googled it. This var is interesting. In C Sharp, you don't have to declare the exact type of things. You can just say var 
and that's a placeholder. And C sharp, if it can do what's called type inference and like figure out the correct type, it'll stick it in there. Um, so a lot of times if you just need to like grab the return value of something, but you don't really care what type it is, you can just put var in there. It's not quite the same as saying object um, because object means like you're 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 just using the top of the inheritance hierarchy and taking advantage of Liskov substitution principle that the highest base class pointer can reference anything below it. It's not that. Var literally just means like we know a type needs to go here. And as long as C sharp, the compiler can figure out the type, it'll just fill it in for you when it compiles it. Um, so Java doesn't have this var feature. Now it is possible that C sharp will tell you like, look, I can't figure out what type you meant by var. You need to give me more information. So if you had a program where you just labeled everything var, C sharp will be like, I don't know the type of anything. You got to give me some specific information. But once you've labeled a number of things as like string and int and list and whatever, the few remaining things that are var, a lot of times the, the type system can do what's called type inference. It can infer what those types are, what they must be, and then fill those types in. Um, is Do you need to know that? No, um, you don't have to use it, but it's good to know what it is because you see a lot of C-sharp code that just takes advantage of this var feature. It is very convenient. So what type does this come out as? I don't know. So I'm, I'm just going to put that in there. Now, what I'm doing is I'm saying file read all text and put that in this string text. That just This is just like a static method in the file class. Read all the text. Now, why is there an and at sign here if this isn't a multi-line string? I don't know. I think we could take it out, but the example I saw online had it in there, so I just left it in there. We could do some further testing on that. Check this out. Var books equal... JSON serializer, deserialize. And this is a generic type. I want to get back a list of books from the text with these options. So this one line combined with this book class is able to take this big JSON data file, right? Take this whole thing and boom, turn it into a freaking list of books. That's what pop, that's what this type is, is list of books right? List of instances of book where, you know, all of these values are stuck in for all of these fields, for all of the stuff that's in there. All of that, one line, plus this one simple class. Oh, love it. Mwah, magnificent. Cool. Then what are we doing once we've got that? This is now a list of books. Well, we're grabbing a random book, book number four. Why book number four? I don't know. We're saying the delimiter, this is a line break in... um in HTML. And then I'm doing a join. So I'm saying like, okay, take the authors of the book. Cause there might be multiple authors that that could be a list of authors. And I'm saying like, okay, um, join those together with a line break in between them. That's why when we look at this, the authors, it's hard to see, but they are on separate lines. Um, it's hard to see cause, cause this is so huge, but they are on separate lines. Um, and then what's our response? Ah, check this out. Uh, so I've got, again, the at sign because it's a multi-line string, the dollar sign because I'm going to do some string interpolation. I've got table border, table row, table header. This is the header. What do I mean by header? What I mean by that is this part here, the part that's bolded and that's the column headers. And then what am I doing in the code? Well, I'm um, putting in table row, and then there's the table data, book.title, authors, book.short description, book.long description, and authors. This isn't book.authors because that's a list, and you would get some weird string representation. That's this string because I kind of know authors, if you go look at, at book, authors is a list of strings. And like, I don't want to get the weird string representation of like the two string method of a list. What I actually want is like the authors one after another with a line break in between them. So that's why I went ahead and, um, you know, did this join here. So I, so that's now sitting in this lovely string and that's what's getting stuck in there. So that's what generates. That's why we get that table. And then what do we do? Well, we take that HTML response, this giant string we generated. We, you know, convert it into an array of bytes and set the, they, you know, do do the whole thing. And then write and flush the HT, uh, uh, HTTP response. And then the client receives all that. It's HTML. And so it can render it and show you this table. Now, here's what's kind of uh, amazing about this. Um, 
let me just pause and let the beauty of this sink in. So let's go back to here and look at what this is. So this was slash books. You can do other stuff. We can do books dot, you know, I don't know, dog slash cat or something like that. Oh, and that's going to fail. Uh, why is, oh, well, I can, I, I know why that's failing. Um, Because the path isn't books. It's now book slash dog slash cat. So what this means is your dispatcher, which is essentially, uh, the part that's doing dispatch is in the process method is this part where we're getting the file name is printing and saying is the path. We would have to like get everything up to, but not including the first slash. We'd have to get this part books and then I have to check that. Right. So we have to do a little bit of extra work here to get the dispatching correctly. Um, and the reason I say book slash dog slash cat is you may want to do something like books and then have like, I don't know, a lookup command to look up author, you know, you know, Jones or something like that or or something. Right. You, you can figure out some some set of URL commands. So you're like books, look up, you know, do a lookup by author of Jones, or maybe you just want it to be look up author or L author. I don't know. You can figure out whatever you want. So as long as you dispatch books and then the book servlet would have to like look beyond books in the request and figure out what it wants to do. That would be one way to do it. The other way to do it is to use request parameters. So this is where this part comes in. So this still will dispatch books. We have this dollar X equal five and percent Y equals seven. And I don't think this is going to, yeah, it's not printing any of that. I'll show you with foo. But basically, that's a way of giving extra information to the server for a server-side program. You, you can do it for a web page as well, but it's like not clear how that's going to really help you. So let's go back to foo. So if we do this with foo, really? We're going to, there we go. Um, we're seeing request by foo. We're seeing this. This is the last piece that we didn't really, we didn't really uh, talk about. Let's go back to that foo servlet, which is here. So if you look, here's this piece of code we never really dug into. We're saying for string s and context request query string all keys. The query string is a map from key to value. What are the keys? Well, the keys are, in this case, X and Y, and the values would be five and seven. And even though this looks like an integer and this looks like an integer, they're going to be strings because, you know, you know you're parsing a, a query string, right? So we're, we're iterating through all these, and then we're um, taking the response, which is was this so far, and we're concatenating on the end of it, and this just means interpolated string, inside a paragraph tag so that we get the line breaks, you know, the key, which, you know, X and then maps to, and then its value, which in this case would be, you know, five and then Y maps to seven and whatever else. Now, when you're deciding, so basically what I'm getting at is, you know, you could do, I don't know, a whole bunch of things with this. So with your books, you could say, oh, I want to look up books and my, function equal, you know, you know, I don't know, list, and then ampersand start equal 10, ampersand end equal 50, right? And so you could say like, okay, well, when I get the book servlet, I need, I need to look at the request parameters. And if the function is list, I need to look at start and end. And this would be saying like list books 10 to books 50. So you would like, get your big list of all the books from the, uh, what is that thing called? From the JSON file, which which it already does. That's going to be a list. Now just like sub, sub list that to get 10, you know, books 10 through 50 and then generate a big HTML table of that and ship that to the client. Maybe you don't want list. Maybe you want search and then, you know, buy equal, you know, author and, you know, name equal Jones, right? Maybe this. And so your, your function could be list. It could be search. Like you can make up your own commands. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, you know, listing books 10 through 50, maybe that's the news. Maybe you want to list all the books by somebody named Jones. Okay, great. So we make up some way to do that function is search. 
search by author because you might also search by title and then name equal Jones. So search anything that matches that um, and so on. So like you, you can build in functionality so that then we can like muck around with these URLs and then go ahead and search for this stuff. Um, now the super advanced version of this would be to have forms, which are HTML pages, where we do a post, which then calls this and blah, 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 blah. We're probably not gonna do that here. We're probably just gonna muck around with the URLs, but um, that's still really cool, right? You, you can build in functionality so that you have this data. It's a huge, I don't want to, I mean, it's, it's basically a database. It's a JSON file. So it's not like a full database. It would be hard to update and whatever else, but it's acting like a database. We can really elegantly deserialize or, or, or magically convert that into a list of instances of books. Now we can have functions on our server that like look up certain books or display certain books, display lists of books, you know, we can potentially have things that insert books. I don't know. There's a lot of really powerful stuff that we can do by invoking these server-side programs, which I'm calling servlets. They're not really servlets, but let's just pretend that they're servlets. Um, so that's what's going on. This is super cool, super powerful. Okay, that's video number two. In video number three, we will start adding features, but I wanted to just get some basics of like how to get everything to work. Now, let me stop recording. Take care, all.